here in the Chicago area. And, um, you know, some of you guys may be very familiar with, with Alternative Schools Network and their work. But I've got Precious Wright, who is a uh, program manager for the YES program, and Michael Hannon, who is a program director. And so they have got some pretty intensive dropout prevention services that they offer. And so we wanted them to bring um, what they do at Altern Alternative Schools Network to you guys and, and um, how they work with the youth and, um, you know, work with dropout prevention. So Precious and Michael, thank you guys so much for being on the call with us. And I'm going to turn it over to you. No problem. This Hi. is Precious. Hi. Hi, good morning. This is Mike. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, we are very familiar with uh, quite a few of your organizations. And thank you, Tammy Stone, for allowing us to provide this webinar today. We're going to get started. I um, want to go over a little bit of history um, with Alternative Schools Network. We've been around for over 40 years now, uh, established in 1973. Uh, providing a network of support for our community-based schools. Um, I think at this point we have about 19, 19 member schools. Uh, they're uh, considered to be not-for-profit, independent, uh, self-governing uh, high schools, alternative high schools, uh, providing uh, youth and uh, adult education. Our vision, ASN, envisions a global community where every individual has access to equal educational and employment opportunities. Our early uh, funding came through uh, federal job readiness and training grants. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar uh, with the youth, division of, youth divisions of CETA, uh, JTPA back in the day. Um, and our model is a little unique. You know, you'll hear about that in our talk today. And we hope that there are some parallels in our relationships with partner organizations and clients that will make this a, a meaningful topic for you. All right, um, dropouts, uh, given a second chance through ASN. We really focus on second chances, realizing uh, the importance of um, having situations where our, our youth or uh, our program participants will, you know, go away, go away and come back, go away and come back and uh, still have an opportunity for them to do so. Not everyone learns the same way. Um, the number of students out of school in Chicago has fallen just as the number enrolled into, uh, into Chicago has fallen. But the, I think the question remains the same. How can we best serve students and our program participants in our program that have left or been pushed out of school or out of our programs um, so that we can uh, achieve those metrics and outcomes that um, some of our funders... Is that me? Sorry. Is that my fault? Is that on my end or your end, you guys? Do you hear that? I do. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it, which end it is, but that's okay. Continue on. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so we just wanted to highlight um, that ASN is definitely invested uh, in giving dropouts a second chance through our programming and our 19 member high schools. Yeah, I wanted to add to that. In some ways, what ASN does is, or our schools do is dropout retrieval, right? They're finding kids that have dropped out at, or, le or left school for other reasons, not just dropping out. Um, and they haven't finished at their home high school or they've transferred, they've moved to Chicago and they haven't been able to find a school that will accept them. So we're, we're in some ways we're doing dropout or push out retrieval. However, once students are enrolled in our partner schools, we are also doing dropout prevention because um, kids that have dropped out once, it's easy for them to drift away and leave school again. Um, one of the things that we have done quite a bit of over the years is bring experts uh, to our schools to talk with our schools and also we've commissioned studies about the importance of uh, job development with youth and the importance of second chance education. Uh, we know um, from those studies commissioned with uh, universities like Northeastern University in Boston, Drexel University in uh, Pennsylvania, and University of Illinois Chicago, we know from those studies that people that do not complete high school and do not have early job experiences are in a high likelihood of lower wages throughout their lifetime. Um, and higher negative experiences, including um, shorter lifespans and more health incidents. So we see the linkage of being in school and job readiness is really entwined and a lot of our programming really 
comes out of that philosophy. Um, there is a, an organization called the National Dropout Prevention Center that does research on this. Um, and when they talk to students who have left school, they find out that it's not just dropping out that's going on with these youth, right? Um, they're, they're just like anything, there's push reasons that people are leaving and there's what they call it falling out reasons. Um, and those are things that happen at the school. So at the school, they might be missing too many days um, or they might come to the conclusion, it would be easier for me to just go get my GED. Um, they're getting poor grades or failing. Sometimes it's just that they don't like school or they don't like being there. Um, and all those things might lead to them not keeping up with their schoolwork. Uh, they feel like they're not going to be able to complete the course requirements with their cohort, right? They might be looking at graduating at 20 or 21 and feeling uncomfortable with that. So they just drop out. They don't get along with teachers. They don't feel like they belong there. Um, they can't get along with their peers. They were suspended. They changed schools and they didn't like the new one that they wound up at. They thought that they would fail competency tests. That's really true in New York where they have to pass a competency test to receive a high school diploma. That's not true in Illinois so much. Um, they did not feel safe or they were expelled. When I, when I talk to people about what we do here at Alternative Schools Network, I often say, you know, there's as many reasons that kids leave school as there are kids who left school. Every reason is personal to them, right? Um, and these kind of factors that they describe here, I think, are um, symptoms of deeper roots. Um, sometimes it's issues of poverty or homelessness that are behind these stories. But this is, these are the ways that youth perceive their reasons for leaving school um, very often. And these are the push and fall. So these are factors that are within the school environment. But then, of course, there are pull factors, too. We think of these as issues that are outside of the school environment, things that make, it's not that youth are leaving school necessarily, they're going to something else. So um, young people become pregnant or become fathers, too, I think should be listed there, or had to support a family. So young parents, teen parents may feel like they need to get a job. Sometimes they have to take care of members of the family. We've had students over the years who have a ill a parent who's fallen ill or has other problems or addiction or you know kind of personal family issues that they feel like they'd be better off out of school taking care of that family member by earning money or literally being in the home. Um, sometimes young people want to get married. <laughs> uh, a lot of times it's getting a job though. So they might not need job readiness, they might be go-getters, but they're earning money on their own and they feel that sense of independence and that they could not work at the same time. Um, a lot of these issues probably sound familiar to us. Maybe you've known youth in your programming that have faced some of these push out factors or heard them when they leave your programs tell you that story, right? Like, well, I've got a job, I'm done. I don't need to, you know, be connected to this program anymore. Um, so when we were thinking about this webinar, we were just thinking about the fact that a lot of what we're doing is trying to address or provide supports that address these issues. And I think uh, as we talk about our program design, um, some of the different programs that we run, you're going to hear different elements within our programming that address these issues. Best practices. Um, we, uh, through research and um, doing a lot of this work, different programming in different ways, uh, we've come up with a, what I think is a strong list of uh, best practices that we do. Um, small school populations. You know, I went to Walter Payton College Prep. I think they're nearing about a thousand students right now. Uh, take a pause. 
Okay, I believe that's gone. Um, <laughs> uh, Mike was sharing with me the other day, um, his kid graduating from Lean Tech, and they have about 2,000? Right. No, 4,500. Oh, oh gosh, almost 5,000 students. So um, our schools, the, 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 the lowest amount we've seen is about 100. Um, the highest amount is about 425 total students, total populations. Um, smaller class sizes, 20 students or less. Um, I think see, this is more of like 25 to 30, 35 even. Um, smaller teacher to student ratios, uh, which provides opportunities for stronger tutoring, one on one opportunities um, before school, after school uh, to help increase their academics. Uh, skilled teachers engage, uh, being able to engage successfully with disconnected youth. Um, I know we, you know, we bounce around that, that title disconnected youth, at risk youth, opportunity youth, urban youth, you know, some of us like those, some of us don't. Um, but we, we do know how important it is for teachers to be aware of the barriers of our students and to be able to work um, closely with them and know how to problem solve and deal with conflicts. Um, our programs, small programs, about 100 to 200 students, um, performance-based goals and outcomes, of course, uh, focusing on not just on uh, parameters around what whichever grant we're using or whatever the metrics are for that, but keeping a holistic approach. Uh, based on our mission, um, to see those metric and, and outcomes be at a higher rate than than we, you know, like like to see. Uh, strong experience, leadership, and teaching staff. Uh, we think professional professional development is very important here. Uh, we do a lot of training with our staff throughout the year. Um, some fun stuff. Sometimes we literally pick ourselves up and head out to Lake Geneva to have some of our training and and do some um, team building with our staff and our teachers. Uh, positive peer culture with the family atmosphere of cooperative support, you know, that whole 360 idea that it's not just about the student, you know, you have, have to have a good relationship with the parent, uh, the grandmother, um, the cousin, you know, whatever the case may be. And sometimes it comes down to making sure we know who the boyfriend is or the girlfriend is so that we can stay connected with the, the student or the participant so that they can be successful, um, especially when we see that they're nearing a uh, dropout of our services. Uh, high standards for student learning, um, small teams of students supported by our staff. Um, each of our schools, you, you'll hear more about this in our programming, but each of our schools, uh, when, when we run our programs inside the school, we, they either call them mentors. Um, I think that's for YS3, you'll hear about that, our DCFS program. Um, and then for our program, my program under WIOA, we call them career coaches. So at each school, we have the staff that's designated uh, to run our programs as the program managers um, internally oversee it. So, you know, lots of, lots of good staff and oversight, I think. Uh, comprehensive technology learning centers, you know, making sure we understand how important the internet is. You know, we, we like to joke that our, our students come out of the womb knowing how to work the internet, um, but being able to utilize it in good ways for job searches, um, you know, doing the college applications, navigating FAFSA, all of that kind of stuff, just making sure that they have access to the, to the technology as it continues to grow every day. Um, less punitive systems, you'll hear more about this as well um, for behavior issues. You know, I really, I really appreciate our mission um, as it relates to dealing with behavior, behavior issues inside the school instead of just, you know, suspending uh, a student for fighting or, you know, having a conflict with a teacher. We've developed uh, quite a few peace, what's called peace rooms inside of our schools, where it's literally a room, you know, we, we put a lot of focus into what the room looks like, you know, warm colors, you know, painted on the wall, nice comfy couches, um, maybe even sometimes using aromatherapy methods where, you know, it, it smells a certain way when you enter the room so that it's an opportunity where it's not like, okay, you had a fight today, you know, we're sending you home, we're letting your parents know what's going on and that's it. And we'll see you in a week or two. It's more like, okay, you, John and Sally or Sally and Sue, you guys had an issue, a conflict today. You guys want to, you know, have a talk about it, you know, sit, sit, in, sit in this room for X amount of you know, minutes or time, hash it out, hug and kiss, and go back to go back to go back to class. <laughs> um, so we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. But just some of the best practices that we've seen that really works well with our schools. Partnerships. Oh boy, everybody knows how strong um, how uh, how strong partnerships need to be in order to have success in our programs. 
And so we just wanted to, this is definitely not um, an exclusive list, but we just wanted to highlight some of the partners that we've had both in the past and present um, across the realms of school employer and supportive service. Uh, school partners, right now we have our ASN Preparatory Institute, which is our school that's literally uh, for our GED program. Um, Pedro Albizo Campos High School, we have a really strong partnership with them. They're over on our Californian division, um, also uh, working with the Puerto Rican Cultural Center. Jane Addams High School, Chicago State University, to try to do some programs out of there, uh, do some CNA classes um, and things like that. Employer partners, we really pride ourselves on doing strong job readiness training and allowing our students to access job opportunities, internships, and things like that. Norwegian Hospital has been a great partner. Uh, Urban P. Lone, Southwest Airlines is a new partner for us. Uh, Peaches Restaurant, they've been a partner maybe about two years, I wanna say, uh, through our culinary program. Uh, Starbucks has been a really great partner of ours as well. Um, supportive service partners. So we know, you know, we'll, we'll get into wraparound services in a bit, but we know that we can't do everything um, in our offices. And so we definitely have to refer out, have strong referral systems, be able to check back in on the referrals and some of those agencies uh, are Action for Children. Uh, the Emergency Fund for Housing and Homelessness, Catholic Charities, they do quite a bit of work. They're also, they can also be listed under uh, employer partner because they take some of our interns. So does BUILD. Um, Fourth Presbyterian Church, uh, we use them for um, referrals for counseling, mental health. Um, we know a lot of that is not going on here in the city of Chicago. And so being able to have a few people to refer out is very helpful for us. Getting into some of the logistics on some of the programs we have in-house here. This is the um, program for our DCFS youth called YS3, Youth Scholar Skills and Services, ran by Keith Thomas. Serves about 215 youth in care um, in about 15 of our schools. Each youth has a mentor. They receive tutoring and they also have opportunities uh, to receive stipends. Uh, and internships through their uh, paid after school program programming called ACE. Focusing on attendance as a metric, enrollment, uh, graduation, and documentation, case notes. So, uh, we owe folks on the line, I know they understand case <laughs> notes <laughs> and how important it is to not only just do the work, but we have to record and have a record of, uh, you know, from start to finish on how our students are doing, progressing, or even regressing. Um, we do college tours all the time, uh, graduation luncheon is pretty popular every year uh, where our students are able to reflect on the services and the education and, and share with us, you know, what we did or, or, or what we um, did well to, to help them with their success. That's a really, really good opportunity for that. Lots of after school uh, opportunities. Um, and we're working on now providing opportunities and support past graduation. Um, I myself is a, I myself um, consider myself to be uh, emancipated uh, youth in care. I was a foster child until I turned 18 and went on to college. And I still felt like, you know, once I was pretty much cut off from DCFS, I needed a little bit more support. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm an adult now, but I, where's my, where's my counselor? Where's my, where's my, uh, my team of, of, of helpers here? So we, we want to do some extended um, support past graduation, not just in this program, in a lot of our programs. Uh, youth Experience Success, yes, that's our We Are Funded program. Um, it's ran out of 11 of the member schools. We focus on work-based learning, um, which is an opportunity like the ACE program over at YS3, providing stipends for internships uh, and career pathway roles and uh, partners with work careers. We do a lot of mentoring um, that comes from our career coaches being physically on site at the school. Um, so they have a spokesperson to help them, you know, speak with teachers, you know, another person to help speak with parents if necessary. Um, to deal with all the issues outside of school and academics um, that we have to focus on to help them be uh, successful inside the school. Um, lots of strong uh, tutoring opportunities, um, very structured, uh, and additional services to help them uh, achieve that high school diploma where they probably were not uh, traditionally successful in a CPS school. 
Um, we focus on home visits. So if you see that uh, a student is not attending school for X amount of days, um, it's not just a quick phone call. We don't just keep voicemails. We actually uh, go out to their homes, knock on doors, uh, try to connect with alternative contact. That's very important, even when we're doing the enrolling, because we know, you know, the, our students, our program participants, their phone numbers can change the next day after they get into this. And so uh, um, being strategic about making sure we know the grandmother's number, you know, the uncle number, um, or a teacher who they uh, establish a really good relationship with, they probably know how to get a hold of them as well. So alternative contacts and home visits are very important in our program. Um, social media correspondence, you know, all of our, before I can find a student, you know, using their phone number or their email, sometimes they're just on Facebook and they'll answer you quicker that way. So, you know, we're really trying to uh, make sure we have uh, program specific uh, web pages on all the sites, you know, YS3 has got an Instagram page. Um, YES is working on our Facebook, uh, Facebook group so that we can um, connect with our youth because we know that they're on there. And like I said, sometimes we can catch them uh, on social media before they call us back. Um, and then follow-up services. Again, you know, even after they are exited from our program, we have to follow them up to a year and even after that. Because again, you know, the the need for support continues on, even if we consider them to be successful and successfully exit our program. We still like to be around and be a contact for our students long-term. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that was already mentioned was the role of mentors in the schools. Um, but we also have programs that provide counselors. These counselors uh, provide one-on-one -on -one and group counseling with students. We're, we have a project called Compass Counseling. It's had it for many years, for uh, 25 years probably, I think, providing Compass Counseling. Um, this is funded duly through the city and the state. Um, my Department of Human Services, the Department of Family Support Services, we're able to serve 450 youth in 11 member schools. So again, these are students that want to provide a counselor, and then as long as we've got the funds, we had a fixed number of 11 schools for a while, but sometimes schools will drop out and then we'll pick up somebody else. Um, and really it's, uh, we do some training with these counselors. Um, some of them are uh, trained in counseling. Many of them are just, um, you know, really effective uh, workers in the school that have strong relationships with students. Um, and then we provide the professional development so they can turn that into strong counseling. Um, and then they link them to supportive services and opportunities for activities outside of school. The director of that, Harris, is a, a licensed social worker. So he brings a lot of expertise to the site-based counselors that are working in the schools. Um, I myself, I direct mostly out of school programming. That's kind of my corner of the world. Um, I have a, a project called Project Innovations, which we do STEM education in two alternative high schools. Uh, this is part of like trying to provide out of school time, high interest, highly engaged career track programming that will be another incentive for students to remain in school, right? We think that um, one of the reasons, remember back to the push side of the reasons that people leave school or youth leave school, is that they feel like there's nothing there for them or they feel like they're not learning anything or they don't like their classes. So sometimes after school becomes a space where you can create a project that you can't offer a whole class for in school, um, but you can provide it as an after school or a before school programming. It's another incentive for youth to come to school. Um, we've done a lot of robotics projects, design thinking projects, and they really do link to careers. So even though it's not a career-based program exactly, it has led to youth getting internships at the Shedd Aquarium um, downtown in downtown Chicago uh, and other opportunities after high school. Another DFSS funded program is the Opportunity Time Programming, very similar. We've got uh, digital media and arts programming to that. Um, after School Matters is probably the most famous thing on this list. Those of you in Chicago are probably familiar with After School Matters programs. 
this is us during the school year we were serving just two schools um and four six students last year however we also have formal programming through after school matters where we have 10 programs that are in seven different schools and they range from and those, all of those kind of blend career track with uh you know arts or other kind of programming so last year last summer we had three culinary programs which served a total of 90 youth um, we had um, uh, three two video programs um, we had uh, two robotics programs and then we had internships including that partnership you saw listed earlier with Norwegian American hospitals we had five interns working in the school they had different placements in different departments around the hospital I said in the school in the in the hospital um, and then we had other internships with other neighborhood organizations for matters. I also run 21st Century Community Learning Centers. We have six sites, um, and they are ranging from Las Spira Schools in the northwest side of Chicago all the way down to Outlook Academy, which is located in South Holland. Each of these serves around 100 students, and we always try to do a bit of tutoring, homework support. Uh, recreational activities, sports activities, as well as career opportunities. So um, at the stronger programs, I'd say you, you've got a little bit of all of that. And you know, for a, a young person that wants to be doing basketball in the school, it's a great opportunity to do that after school. They have to be in school to attend basketball, right? So it's another incentive. Here's just a couple of photos <laughs> of some of that stuff that was happening last year. So the culinary program on the right and an arts program on the left. We did a huge gallery presentation of some pieces that work. Um, one of the things that we think about a lot is how can we help impact what the school is offering during the day? Uh, and so we do that through sort of partnership special development programs. Um, one program that I run is Project Engage and ASN News. So it's an ongoing teacher training. We've been doing it for about six years now. Um, we offer it in the evenings. We did, we're going to be doing nine sessions this year where teachers can come in, they participate, they can get mini grants for their classroom to provide uh, a school newspaper, to create a blog, a video in their classroom. So we've had a lot of really um, interactive projects come out of that that happen at the school. We don't do them, we do them, but it's an opportunity to help them gain the skills to do more project-based learning, which we think is a really great way to engage youth voice and supports their social emotional development, as well as being an academic um, improvement in the school. Uh, we also had a youth summit last May where we had teams from five different schools, as well as teams who came from out of state actually come and present their civic office. We think that you know, getting youth back and engaged in civic issues is a, a, an important goal for our partner school, so we'd like to support that as best we can. The Community Youth Employment Program is another strand of re uh, job readiness and workplace style learning. In some ways, it's similar to a WIOA grant. Mm -hmm. um, the goal is to place to subsidize employment with our community partners and employer partners. But the goal is always to transition and to subsidize employment. Um, we subsidize for a period of 14 weeks, and it could be based, some of it's based in schools, so they might be doing work within a school, but a lot of it is based with employer partners. We served 175 youth last year at seven schools. Um, and again, we have a similar set of goals, right? We're helping them, we're helping the youth set career and education goals, but then we're also tracking attendance, we're tracking all similar outcomes that WIOA has. So you're probably familiar with that. Um, we provided a Cook County Violence Prevention Program in two schools last year. Very similar kind of array of services all out of school time. So we had uh, 50 students in two schools. Um, again, we're going back to that sort of tutoring, academic enrichment, after school activities, and social skill development. All those kinds of things that 
build community in the school and help students feel like this is the right step. Um, the fostering learning program is a uh, partnership with um, mostly TLPs and other residency programs around the state of Illinois. The manager um, has sort of a, assembled an array of online learning um, programs where youth can earn credits while they're not in school, but live, you know, receiving services within their residency program. Um, so there were 330, or there 265 youth in care served last year. Um, that's in some ways it's just providing uh, curriculum to the schools, but we also coach the teachers and teach them how to integrate the online learning with the instruction that they're already doing with youth in their programs. All right, going back to um, our job readiness program over at YS3, uh, added chance. Uh, we provide uh, lots of job training and placement services uh, to the youth in care, um, ages 16 to 20. Able to provide 320 career trainings per year. Again, lots of job training, counseling, and employment services. We're over on uh, 1122 North Milwaukee. Just wanted to give a snapshot for them. That, that's um, a sort of shorter term training. It's not like a, an in-depth program the way we owe it. But. Right. Helping kids punch up their resume, learn about seeking jobs online, and make those phone calls, and also a youth development uh, portion too. Thank you, Mike. Sorry. No, that's <laughs> good. That's good. Uh, the re-enrolled student project. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Re-enrolled student project is uh, uh, funded through um, uh, state, sorry, community colleges, Illinois Community College Board, um, and I believe also. CEO funded it at one point. Um, and this is a program that's meant to provide enhanced services to students who are in our partner schools. This is additional funding outside of the regular tuition that they receive um, from the state where they can develop programming that's innovative and supportive for students to keep them in school. It might include um, it might include tutoring, uh, college gotcha. field trips, and other things. So again, Trying to complete the high school experience in an alternative school. Yeah, make school more fun. Another uh, another counseling program, the Mayor's Mentoring Initiative. Uh, this is a small program; it's only serving one school. However, we are trying to expand it. At the last um, go round of RFP, we applied to serve an additional four, I believe. Um, again, trying to bring those practices of creating an environment. Where youth might struggle being in a school environment, and they have behavior issues with the youth in school, and they might have other groups sitting in the front thing. So we're trying to provide some mentoring and coaching, and you know, therapeutic sort of setting where where youth can grow into the school and really become part of the community. Hey, Mike, you're cutting out just a little bit when you talk, so. Okay, yeah, well, we can fix that. I think I'm, I probably am facing the wrong way sometimes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Right, okay. um, so one of the things that we mentioned earlier is trying to inform the work that happens inside the schools. As partners to the schools, we want to bring them professional development opportunities for their mentors or their counselors, but also sometimes we want to expand that to uh, the teaching staff as well. And I think there's been a lot of conversation lately about the concept of trauma-informed practices in school. Even Chicago Public Schools is talking about it now. And it's really a question of how do we engage with you who may have, may have struggled in the past and may currently be struggling as you know, students in the classroom. There might be behavior issues that emerge that we and we're not ready to prepare, readily prepared to deal with. So there's a ton of research out there now that trauma that happens to you when you're young affects you throughout your life. Um, and so what we want our schools to do is one, develop an approach for working with a youth who may may struggle in that environment not go straight to suspension or um, even expulsion, 
but to take steps to reintegrate them in the classroom or put them in the classroom. And before we get to that point, we think that all schools should be thinking about self-care, identifying youth that have been through trauma early on, right, and helping work with them to be resilient within the school organization. So we've developed partnerships with uh, around um, mindfulness training, um, uh, like Umoja is in Chicago, mm -hmm. and other partners who can come in and work with our teachers and give them options. And we've done whole staff trainings and then track them for the course of the whole year, like coming back and assessing how they're growing or developing into being more uh, trauma-informed in their practice. Sorry about that typo, free fruit. <laughs> um, and yes, in prep, uh, this is, our, we mentioned it before, this is just our, um, out of our 19 schools, this is our GED specific campus, um, serving approximately 40 youth, uh, ages 17 to 24. Again, another opportunity uh, to serve youth who may not have been successful in a traditional school setting and allowing them um, more time to actually achieve their diploma, um, even if they're a little bit older. Um, it's about 12 weeks provides a lot of mentoring and wraparound services, um, both my program, the YES program, and the YS3 uh, DCFS Youth and Care program um, are focused out of our uh, GED prep site. They're over, oh yeah, the address is down there, over in uh, Oakwood, 700 East Oakwood. Other opportunities, uh, our basketball program, um, bowling is a new one. I think we just started that last school year. Uh, a lot of students were interested in that um, as a and, you know, competition. You know, it was a, lot, uh, a great way to see some of our students come out and do other things outside of academics. Um, our community action teams, um, civic engagement, uh, panel discussions. We just had one um, systemic on systemic justice um, talking about, uh, you know, wrong, wrongfully convicted felons and reintegrating them into society and providing supports uh, for that. Uh, prom is another way that uh, we allow our students to come together. You know, we, we, we host one prom um, for all of our schools, for those that participate. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good time and a, and a good way to uh, as a staff person, do some crowd control and uh, uh, see the diversity in the room, but I promise a pretty big deal across our schools each year as well to keep our students engaged. Um, and then getting into the meat of some of uh, the, the realms of dropout uh, prevention, um, informing school practices and curriculum is a major one. Wraparound services and support would be a major one. And then of course the career pathways and job readiness. We think these three uh, solid um, uh, initiatives uh, will help us and help you guys, hopefully, with your program participants um, to reduce that rate of dropout. Wraparound and supportive services. Uh, again, you know, of course, we want our students to show up to school. Of course, we want our program participants to participate in our program um, so that we can get those metric and outcomes. But we do know that, you know, other things are behind our students that are that are holding them behind and so you know providing good referrals and good partnerships um, as I mentioned uh, to address some of this is very important uh, child care services we have teen moms teen dads um, homeless prevention homelessness uh, you know we have a lot of couch surfers um, you know it, it's, it's hard to, to, to focus in school or focus on our programs when we know that our students and participants couldn't get a, a good night's rest um, the prior night to have an appointment with us. And so we have to address that. Uh, criminal background, you know, having court support, literally uh, being a staff person that will uh, show up to court with our students and be an advocate for them. That's very important. Transportation services, you know, we have a lot of programs across all of the city. So, you know, we got folks who live on the west side, we wanna introduce them to opportunities on the south side and vice versa. Um, and so transportation and having that partnership with uh, Ventra and CTA, being able to give out those cars and even Uber recently um, uh, is a good um, support for us to provide transportation. Food pantry referrals, uh, clothing, professional clothing, right? We're trying to uh, gear our students up to, in, to be uh, prepared for the workforce. And so sometimes that literally comes down to making sure they have the proper clothing to attend interviews. 
and even down to uh, uniforms once they get the job. Uh, mental health, counseling referrals, uh, providing program incentives, you know, gift cards, you know, um, books, supplies, equipment, healthcare referrals, uh, team parenting support, as I mentioned, and then financial literacy um, is actually a, a, a good deal. I want to say maybe about two hours, two or three hours of our 10 hour job rating this training that we do with our WIOA program. We focus on the financial literacy part, you know, from literally understanding your paycheck, understanding taxes. Um, all the way down to, you know, personal budgeting options and things like that. We know that the, those things are very important. Career pathways and job readiness, uh, providing meaningful work experiences. Um, a lot of our um, internships uh, do come internally on site and within the school. You know, you'll see some of our students literally just be administrative support for our, uh, our teachers or um, um, direct administrative staff. But then, of course, also translating that outside of school once they're ready, once they've been trained and ready to work with an external partner to um, help train them to be able to, you know, get, get there on time. Um, also having that partnership and relationship with the employer to understand that it's a mentoring component to it. You know, the idea is that they're not, even if there are some conflicts or situations going on at their placement, that it's not just an, an immediate um, termination, that there's a there's room for conversation and for growth, even when dealing with conflicts. Um, paid opportunities, unpaid opportunities as well. We do uh, paid apprenticeships, a lot of after school and summer uh, opportunities, um, and link just linkages to the workplace experience. You know, we if you if we've got a kid that's interested in technology, you know, we we would hope that we could potentially, you know, establish a relationship with Google, you know, to, to, to do some sort of uh, on-site internship or job shadowing opportunity. So partnerships and training and, and doing those placements have been very helpful. Um, work readiness work, uh, work, workshops, everyone does that, you know, the typical resume writing, uh, mock interviews, uh, employer expectations, all of that good stuff. So, um, we talked a little bit about what happens in the schools, and I know that we probably have, we're the only organization that has this unique uh, set of partners and alternative schools. However, um, I think that these are things that can happen within programs too. So maybe, uh, you know, these are good things to think about as well. Um, so we do uh, <laughs> information training on the impact of trauma on behavior, health, and wellness, as I think I mentioned already. Uh, we've coached some schools in the practices of restorative justice and trauma-informed practices so, it, um, so that they can develop them. It's, it's one thing to say, oh, we have restorative justice practices and we bring all the kids back into the school. That's not what it takes, right, to do real restorative justice. It's about sitting down and having the difficult conversations with youth, but with a welcoming um, approach that shows that you want to bring them back into the school. But that happens within our programs too. So um, our mentors that are, you know, our youth mentors that are funded or our career coaches have those relationships. And I think we, we haven't talked specifically about the importance of relationships, but relationships are so key to getting youth that are connected from school to stay in school. Because for someone who sees why they're in school and is going to just finish school, they don't have to have those deep relationships. But for kids that are on the edge of being engaged in our programs or in our schools, there needs to be a relationship. They need to have that person that they know that they can talk to, to talk through some of those things. And really restorative justice and trauma-informed practices can enhance that. Um, our program mentors advocate for youth. So if they do run into a problem within the school, they can become their advocates and it can impact the school practice. Um, we always encourage schools to rethink their zero tolerance practices. Um, and then we talked a lot already about peace rooms and mindfulness training. Um, so any way that we can help uh, schools think about their practices to help retain their youth, we try to be a good partner in that way through training and other kind of coaching methods. 
Great. So we wanted to uh, highlight the importance of um, success stories, right? And even for our youth, this becomes very important for them because it provides recognition, uh, motivation, shows support, uh, encourages continued success, and it literally becomes a result of those strong partnerships and relationship building and supportive services that we've provided throughout our programs. And so I just wanted to highlight um, one of our successful youth, Kyla Washington. Um, she was very, before she came to one of our uh, member schools, uh, she had been enrolling in and out of about 10, 10 different uh, high schools here in Chicago, a very unstable and inconsistent education experience. Um, she came to us, uh, to, she went to Excel, Excel Academy Inglewood over on 71st and Morgan. Um, where she was able to uh, establish a really good relationship with our career coach there. She enrolled into our WIOA program, the YES program, Youth Experience Success, um, and she just took off. She really, truly took off. She participated in work-based learning. She was an office clerk for the school. Um, then she participated in our culinary program, uh, Miss and Floss, um, our partnership with Rome's Joy Catering over on the South Side. And this girl ended up being valedictorian of her uh, class in 2017. Um, she finished that culinary program. She obtained all of her uh, surf safe food sanitation licenses. And now she is, uh, has been permanently, permanently hired and has retained her job for over a year uh, with our uh, employer partner, Peaches Restaurant. So just wanted to share that, you know, being able to work with her, provide the wraparound services, think about her um, her whole person holistically providing that support and really seeing her be successful um, after being kicked down 10 times. Um, so we really pride ourselves on the experience and the relationship that we built with her and she's been very successful. So another uh, thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is um, the the importance of the partnerships and sort of trying to innovate and in building partnerships. Um, one of the programs that I mentioned that I run are 21st Century Community Learning Center programs. Um, one of those uh, programs is cited at Dr. Pedro Alviso Campos High School. It's a small alternative high school in Humboldt Park. Uh, and it's an enrollment of about 100 or 200 youth. We try to serve at least 100 youth with our out of school time programming there. And one of the great successes I've had here and in other schools is culinary programming. To me, culinary programming is like this kind of remarkable thing because <laughs> so many things happen in a cooking program. Mm -hmm. You get to eat, which we know that many of the youth that are in our programs are experiencing some forms of youth uh, food scarcity, right? But like, it's also that the kind of camaraderie that they have with other teens, working together on a project, each taking a role, supporting each other, coaching each other, and then the relationships they develop with those, those other students while they're in the program. In addition, it's like you gain this life skill. Right? We all want to be able to take care of ourselves and be able to cook for ourselves. Sometimes we have youth who, like, I don't know if you can see in this photo, this tall guy in the back row in the group photo, his family runs a restaurant. So he was able to become this leader in the program where he was teaching right alongside the, uh, the, the program instructors. So through this cooking program, we developed a partnership with a, a new innovative uh, entrepreneur in Humboldt Park, his name is Roberto Perez. And he has a program called Urban Pilon, where he's teaching the history and fundamental, like the history and nutrition, Puerto Rican and Caribbean cooking to community members. So we were able to create this partnership and the kids learned real chef level skills. I and mean, this guy is really an experienced chef. So they weren't just cooking anymore. Now they're learning a job skill. And as that program wound down last spring, two of the youth were able to get catering jobs working for um, Urban Pilon in May and even across the summer months. It's not full-time employment, but they're building these skills that could lead to it. There are two youth in particular um, who really found a home in this program and that they felt like the coaching that he provided uh, 
was fundamental to them staying in school. So we see out of school time programming as a place where really rich experiences of caring adults can happen and support students remaining in school. All right. I just want uh, to provide. Yeah, we just, uh, this is a list of all of our partner, our member organizations. Most of them are high schools, uh, though not all of them are. And we engage with them in different ways. We have WIOA mentors or WIOA programming there. We have YS3 program. We have after school programming. We provide technical assistance. We help them leverage uh, this kind of member organization as a means to uh, achieve additional funds for their schools. So this is you know, the result of 45 years of work in a lot of ways, but they have all these partners. Um, but each one has its own relationship with us and it's at a different level. Some of them have a ton of programming, some of them don't. Uh, some are just like smaller pro programs. But you, we don't have the addresses here, but they really are in kind of most corners of the city of Chicago. Mm -hmm. So we are able to work with schools all over. This is who we are and how to contact us. Lots of information, hopefully not too overwhelming. Um, but we definitely want you guys to feel comfortable reaching out to us, um, asking any questions, either now or later. Um, and thank you so much. Yeah, and we hope that, um, we know that this is a kind of unique setup of Alternative Schools Network, but we hope that some of these ideas that we shared with you today, some of the practices that we have, could be picked up and used by your programs. And also, if you ever want to discuss our schools, our member schools with us, or you to ones that are convenient for your youth if you're here in Chicago. Okay, I'm taking the time. Precious Michael, thank you guys so much for your presentation. It was amazing. You guys do some amazing work. I want to open it up to our providers. Do you guys have any questions with them? Or what are some takeaways that you've taken from this presentation? You're like, yeah, we could probably incorporate that into our programs. So do we have some of our providers that can ask some questions or some takeaways from this? Hi, this is Mary Ann from Metropolitan Family Services. Um, thank you so much for all the information you gave us. And I, the list of reasons of why students drop out of school really resonated with me and uh, just kind of, you know, gave me some more background on if some of our students are struggling to stay in their, you know, training programs um, that we fund that, you know, it could be some of those reasons that you listed, um, even if they're not sharing it with us. So maybe to, um, you know, develop questions that kind of get at those areas you were speaking about, how there's the ones that pull them out or, or uh, seem to push them out, that there were just so many different things, not just child care and job, but not getting along with their peers, things of that nature that could be beneficial for us to explore moving forward. Great. Yeah, I think. Thanks, Marianne. Do you have anybody else? Um, um, this is Patricia from Erie House. Um, I'm familiar with ASM because I used to work for DCFS, so we had a lot. I had a lot to do with you guys. Um, but also, I like the fact that you're also teaching them like vocational skills that, like, you know, not everyone's cut out for college and. There are alternatives for you. You don't have to go to a four-year university. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we want we want to be able to lead kids where they are. Sometimes follow the kids, right? But make sure that we're providing a diverse. Because I know a lot of people, right? A lot of like you know their case managers would push them to go to college, and then you know obviously within less than the first year they would totally just you mm -hmm. know fail and be kicked out and. You know, you don't want to see that because that discourages them even more. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's, I think that's, then that's partly comes out of the relationships that the, we develop with young people is understanding what their motivations are, understanding what their challenges are, and trying to find the right fit when they transition out of high school or out of our programs. Very good. Thank you. I had Don, he sent a text, great ideas for programming um, ideas we can use. 
Are you also looking um, from us to connect to high schools who are interested in your services? Is that a question? Uh, yeah, was that sort of a question? Yeah, if, I mean, we have a website and we didn't put it in here, but we can send it out. If, you, if anybody okay. wants more information, we'll add it into the, uh, we'll put the website address in there. Um, so if you have youth living in the city, you can go to our website and there's an interactive map there that'll provide you a list of all the programs and you can put in your address and get, you know, like programs within five miles. So that might be a great tool for you if you're working with youth throughout a school that have thought about going back to school. And one, you know, one thing we see a lot is if somebody leaves school for a period of six months or a year, they may not, they may want to go back to school, but they may not want to go to the school that they left because they may have a reputation there or they may have uh, created issues or they're embarrassed to go back in front of their peers that might be graduating in six months. Mm -hmm. So uh, we think alternative schools can really be an option for them, a place where they can develop new relationships and kind of have a fresh start. So I do have a question for ASN. What do you think the say the three, four, and I know there's more than that, primary elements for keeping these people with you. Um, I think, saw a lot of the slides that talk about mentoring, setting up those relationships, um, you know, your support system for these individuals. I love the peace room and, you know, and the ability to kind of let them decompress and think about what's, <laughs> where they're at and what's going on. Um, what, what are key to you guys? What do you think is key to keeping these, in, these youth with you? Um, well, you know, I used to, I taught for uh, about 17 years at one of the partner schools. And um, I think like, first of all, I can't, we can't stress relationships enough. And I think that, you know, they take different forms. Not every teacher has the capacity to be, you know, develop a, a relationship with every kid. So mm -hmm. providing lots of points of interaction for kids where they can find a pathway to feel like they have a relationship with the school. So I think, I think that that's true anywhere with um, a opportunity to use it, but it's creating pathways to part, you know, like partner with them and have them find an identity. Um, another thing is trying to have a system in place, um, whether it's your teachers or your program managers or your mentors who can identify things early and quickly resolve. So if uh, students missed two days, we don't want to wait until they miss five days to make the phone call. So it's like quick response team, getting on the phone, calling the, you know, I think Precious stresses really well. They may not respond to your phone call. So hopefully you've got a parent or an uncle or a cousin that you can reach out to and find out what's going on. But quickly, not after you've waited too much time to pass. And then the other thing is, is I, you know, I just think like variety of experience is key. And some experiences for kids are meaningful and you know, one kid might find meaning in uh, STEM technology or another kid might find meaning in cooking. And I know at the program level, you know, your ability to provide that variety is different than a school-wide program, but if you do you know, try to, to identify those interests and make sure you're providing relevant coaching in those areas. So relevance, I guess, is, is a third point. And I would just add to that um, the importance of being youth informed, um, to, to do the research, to, to involve, literally involve the youth and have them participate um, as you try to build out your programs, you know, provide those uh, surveys, anonymous surveys if you have to. Um, and then this idea of uh, less adulting, you know, less adulting mechanisms where we're like, you know, you should do this because I say so, because I'm the adult and I'm wiser. No, you know, that, that doesn't, that's not working with our, 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 uh, our students, our participants nowadays. So having um, them have a voice uh, in what yes, we're doing yes. and to say, even if it's a program that did not, you know, wasn't, wasn't as successful as we wanted it to be and finding out why and getting suggestions on what they think would be helpful moving forward that would keep them engaged um, and less dropout. That's great advice. Thank you guys so much, so much. 
Um, we're close to our time here, so um, does anybody else have any last question? If not, once again, thank you guys so much, and thank you for putting your information out there. If any of our providers does want to reach out and get some additional information or maybe have some referrals, you know, for youth for these guys, that would, that would be, you know, great. Um, and once again, thank you. Um, for our providers, um, I will be sending out um, your, your cost information and just some questions like I did last time as far as performance and where we're at with that. And just one piece of information I want to give you, good news, Tara is going to be back next week, um, not full time. Uh, Precious and Michael, this is an individual that's been working with us who just had a baby and she's, her baby's adorable. Um, so she'll be back next week and then so you'll be probably seeing some communication from Tara next week also. But I just wanted to let you guys know. Um, thanks again and we really appreciate it and everybody have a marvelous day. Hey, Thank Tammy. You. Yes. Thank you. This is yes. uh, Eddie. Can either you or Natasha give me a call when you have a chance? I have a question in regards to um, we just started a cohort, and uh, it's an Illinois WorkNet question in regards to um, we're currently partnering with uh, Sabina.